Brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So last week, we considered the work of Guido da Siena in the 1270s AD. We looked at his painting of the Nativity, um, which was a classic example we talked about last week of what was called Byzantine art. Quick refresher for those of you who were here and those of you who weren't. Byzantine art is basically characterized by about three different things. It's characterized by images of people that are elongated, um, that are emotionless in their depiction. In Byzantine art, you don't have characters with smiles on their faces, with frowns on their faces. They don't have any expression at all because that's considered to be too worldly. Byzantine characters are also always, always, always two-dimensional. You will never see a piece of Byzantine art that's 3D because the folks back in those days were concerned that by creating anything 3D, that that would create an idol, which went against the commandment. And so they always made sure that everything was as flat to the image as it could be. And Byzantine art, as we talked about last week, was very much driven by rules, by ways in which these paintings needed to be composed in terms of proportions, in terms of elements, colors, all kinds of things, because all those things had rules and they had meanings in terms of Byzantine art. And so that's what we did last week, is we looked at that piece. And now, at this precise point in history that we pick up things tonight, we're about 30 years fast forwarded from the piece of art that we looked at last week. Can you go back one real quick, Lance? I'm sorry, my friend, go now forward. There we go. Um, and we go to a guy by the name of Giotto. Um, and Giotto is an artist who, about 30 years after the painting we looked at last week, he was uh, an artist in Italy, particularly in the Florence area. And he got his renown. He became well-known, put on the map, if you will, because he started painting around the Genoa, Padua area of Italy. And he was, to the art world, what Luther a couple hundred years later would be to the Christian church. Giotto comes along in the early 1300s, and he really is a reformer of art as anyone had known it up until that point. He became really famous for these frescoes. And frescoes, of course, is this process by which you take paint and you apply it to wet plaster as it's curing in a building. So these paintings literally become fused to the buildings and to the walls in which they're painted. And this Scorvengi chapel in Padua, Italy in 1306, he spends two years painting all of the depictions of Christ's life and the apostles in this chapel. There's got to be 70 different images that he paints in this little chapel. And so his frescoes really got him on the art world map, and people started to take notice of it. And so we end up taking Giotto, and we look at his artwork because he was really a reformer. And what had been up until that point a very stilted, very rule-driven way of putting together art Giotto comes along, and he reforms all that. And Giotto is really the father of what became known as the Renaissance art movement. Now, Renaissance art took the form of paintings. It took the form of sculpture. It would ultimately take the form of all kinds of different medium. But Giotto is really the guy who starts the whole Renaissance movement. And what he does to reform artwork as people knew it is he decides he's going to color outside of the lines, not just figuratively, but literally. And he's going to do things with artwork and with characters that people had not done before. And so what he begins to do is in his art that he paints, particularly in this chapel where he becomes famous, is he puts greater weight, literally more meat on the bones of the characters that he paints. He creates broader gestures. He puts oh, crazy expressions. He is, to the art world, what emoticons are to cell phones thousands of years later. He puts smiles on people's faces. He puts frowns on people's faces. He makes people look content. He makes people look concerned. And he also ends up creating a place where there's more connection between the different characters in the painting. And so whereas with Byzantine art that we saw last week, the characters hardly are doing anything to relate to each other, Giotto comes along and he has his characters start to actually interact with each other 
in his paintings. This was radically different than how people had done artwork before. And so he really becomes this reformer in the early 1300s, and he starts this Renaissance movement in artwork that would take us through the 1500s and into the 1600s. Of Giotto, it ultimately was said that he rescued and he restored art from what was called the crude traditional Byzantine style. He softened things up. Things weren't so stilted, so driven by rules. And his key, the thing that he brought to artwork, was the fact that he finally decided it's time to make images pop off the canvas, pop off the wall. And so he began to use elements that would create a 3D effect with his characters. Um, it's at this point, of course, in the world of artwork and the world of reformation in the art world that we continue tonight by looking at this series of connecting the dots, of taking different pieces of artwork and looking at what's going on in these paintings and seeing what those things have to do with our faith. And we begin tonight with the notion that some things never change. When we compare what we had last week with what we have tonight, there are certain things that Giotto puts in his piece of art that are very similar to what we saw last week. And we start, of course, with the idea of the sheep and the goats. Just like in the image that we had last week, Giotto has painted a small flock of sheep, and he's also painted a goat. And as we saw last week, the sheep are facing the Christ child, and the goat, who in both images is painted black, is facing away from Christ. Again, no small image of what Christ will grow up and talk about in terms of the sheep and the goats and so forth. And so Giotto has included the same type of image. Um, some things never change. The ox and the donkey were present in last week's image, and they're here again tonight. And of course, you've got the ever-tired Joseph outside of the area where Jesus and Mary are, just like they were last week, and again this week, Joseph appears outside of that, and like last week, his head is on his, his hand, he's resting, he's tired. Go for it, Mary. Elena, would you go back an image, please? There we go. So you saw what, Amelia? You, you know, my friend, you are absolutely correct. In fact, look at this detail. There are two sheep who are facing away. Amelia, what do you think that means, buddy? Let's put on our thinking caps. What could that mean? Say that one more time, buddy. Maybe all Christians don't do exactly what Christ said. She's saying that maybe it means that all Christians don't do exactly what Christ said. <laughs> Once again, I think we're going to have confirmation next Sunday for Amelia. What do you guys think? Is that a fair interpretation? It's not just the ghosts. It's not just those who absolutely reject Jesus, but also... We who follow Jesus don't always look his way. Is that a fair way to put it, bud? We sometimes take our attention off of him and look in different directions. How's that? <clears throat> Very good. Um, so you even got Joseph, tired Joseph, outside of the manger scene, and he is doing what he did last week. He's got his head on his hand, and he's fatigued. And yet, while some things never change, there are some notable differences between what Giotto paints 30 years later and what people like Guido had painted 30 years before in the Byzantine era. And we begin where we just left off, with Joseph. <laughs> and while Joseph is depicted by Giotto in a very similar way that Guido had done 30 years before, he depicts Joseph in a different way than Guido had in the sense that Joseph's eyes here in this depiction are closed. They're not open. He is not looking back at Jesus like Guido had painted. He's looking down. His hair, instead of being nice and brown and healthy, is white. And his arms are not comfortably laying in his lap. They're tucked into his cloak. 
And so what is it that Giotto could be telling us about Joseph? Could it be that what he's really showing us is that Joseph is incredibly stressed out over everything that he has endured for the sake of his betrothed and for the sake of his newborn son. Joseph, the one who mandated by religious law, needed to pack up his wife and his wife who had not yet had their child, bring them back to the place of his birth so that they could be part of the census. He had to do all these details. He had to find the Motel 6, and when they got to the counter and they said, sorry, no more rooms available, he had to scramble and find something else. Joseph has had a lot on his shoulders, and could it be that what Giotto is showing us is that Joseph is flat out tired. He's stressed. And yet, notice what Giotto does too. He puts him in a gold robe. Just like in Byzantine art, there are rules in Byzantine art for how you use color, because color always means something in Byzantine art. The same thing happens to be true with how the Renaissance folks began to depict images, and they started to settle on certain colors having certain meanings. And so what we can take from this is that he's wearing a gold robe, and what gold stands for in Renaissance, in Renaissance art is for royalty, for a heavenly reward. And could it be that what Giotto is showing us is that for as earthly, as human as Joseph is, for as tired as he is, he is bestowed by God with a reward. Dare we say that of Joseph it could be said what Jesus would say in the parable, well done, good and faithful servant. And so while Joseph is tired to his core, while he's absolutely falling asleep with everything that's gone on, he's depicted in a gold robe because he has been a faithful servant. He has received a heavenly reward from God. He's received God's approval, and he is absolutely unequivocally part of God's holy family. Um, something else that's different about tonight than we saw last week is also the midwife. Last week, the midwife in Guido's painting was depicted as being, apart from the scene, a little character, kind of like a little inset, in terms of what was going on. But tonight, the midwife takes a larger role. And she is depicted on the left-hand side of the painting as helping and supporting Mary in her efforts. Mary is trying to lay the baby into the manger, and the midwife is there to literally lend her hand to create a place where Mary can rest and put the baby into her arms, and they together can put him in the manger. She's out on the fringe of the picture, and we'll see in a few minutes that that cannot be an accident. She wears white, which in Renaissance art is a reference to her innocence and to her devotion. This is a woman who is a servant of the first order. She doesn't command the center part of the picture. She is faithfully serving her Lord and her Lord's mother. And that's what she's there to do. Another notable difference is the shepherds tonight. Last week, they were in the same basic position as they are tonight, lower right-hand corner, and yet, last week, we saw their faces. They were visible. This week, they're completely turned away from the action that's going on. They're totally focused on the angel who is above left of them, and, by no surprise, they are on the fringe of the picture. These are not the kinds of guys that polite company would keep company with. These are guys who live on the fringes, who literally live out in the fields, tending their flocks by night. And, as Renaissance art would have it, they are depicted as wearing gray and muted colors because of their lower status in society. These are not guys who are held in high esteem by polite society. And so they're depicted as wearing drab colors because of their lower status, and they're pushed off to the right side of the picture because of their lower status as well. The oxen of donkey, as we said, are back. And it's interesting because last week, where the ox was looking at the donkey, and the donkey was looking down at Jesus, Giotto depicts them in a little bit of a different way. In his depiction, the ox looks at Mary and Jesus, and the donkey, we can't quite tell what it is that he's looking at. If we're going to go ahead and kind of follow around his head, we can imagine that he's looking down, but we can't quite figure out what he's looking at. The ox looks at Mary and Jesus. The ox, which represents God's people Israel, looks directly at Mary and Jesus. They see, the ox sees Jesus for who he is. But does Israel get it? 
They don't. What's interesting about how Giotto depicts the donkey is while we can't quite see what the donkey's looking at, the donkey's ears tell the story. The donkey's ears rest horizontally at the side of his head, which indicates that the donkey's relaxed, it's content, it's happy, and it's listening for a command. And as Jesus grows up, he speaks to the donkeys of the world, to the Gentiles of the world. And what ends up happening? They hear his voice. They follow him. And those who actually see Jesus for who he is, Nicodemus, the Pharisees, the muckety-mucks of Israel's society, what will they do? They won't follow him. And so Jada depicts God's people as looking at Jesus, but perhaps not knowing what to do, while the donkey listens intensely for the child to cry out, and ultimately will listen to the child and follow him. Other notable differences tonight are the angels. Last week, the angels were looking every which way. In fact, one of the angels was looking straight out at us and broke that two-dimensional plane by looking out at us and including us in the picture. Tonight, the angels by Giotto are depicted in various different ways. There are five of them. Three of them look to heaven, and all three of them have almost the identical posture. They're raising their hands in praise, and so can we say that what they're doing is they're offering a Trinitarian form of praise to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. Then what you have on the right-hand side is the one angel who is speaking to the shepherds, declaring to them the good news that has happened, and that angel's right hand is in the form of a Trinitarian blessing. And finally, in the middle, you've got this angel who is depicted in 3D. Giotto paints these black lines around this angel so that that angel jumps off the page. There's the angel that our attention is to be focused on. And where does he look? He looks down. He doesn't look out at us. He looks down on what is happening below in terms of Mary and the baby. And finally, there's Mary. Mary's eyes are heavy. As we look really closely, you can barely see that she has her eyes open. This is a woman who is absolutely wiped out from everything that she has experienced. And yet her eyes, the slits that there are there, are focused entirely on her baby. And what's interesting about the way that Giotto paints her is that her arms cradle Jesus. And she's in a reclining position. And yet the way her arms cradle Jesus and the fact that she's reclining doesn't allow her to rest. It's an odd position to paint a human being because if we were to do this, we would find this to be one of the most uncomfortable things we could do. This is not a position of rest for Mary. What Mary's doing is she is entirely concerned about the baby that she has just born. She's cradling him, she's supporting him at the expense of supporting herself, even though she's laying down. She provides support to her son at the expense of her own comfort. And notice what she wears today. Last week, Guido had her painted as wearing black, which in Byzantine art, meant someone who had given up all earthly pleasures for the sake of God, which we know Mary did, right? From the moment that Jesus was born, Jesus is on his way to the cross. And Mary is going to suffer mightily. Everything that she could have had in terms of earthly pleasure, she has had denied because she has been chosen by God to bear the Savior of the world. And that will pierce her to her heart's core. And so she's depicted in that painting last week as wearing black. In this painting, Giotto paints her wearing blue. And in Renaissance art, blue is always the color of fidelity. Blue is always the color that's used of a person who will cling to something and will not let go, especially blue is used when it's in reference to a sacred space. And so it makes total sense. Mary is depicted as wearing blue because she will be her son's mother, God's son's mother, from the moment of his birth until his death. When Jesus hangs on the cross, how many people are there with him? Three. Who are they? Mary, 
John and his mom. She will remain in a state of fidelity to her son, even though it pierces her to her core. And she will watch her son die on the cross because that's how committed she is to her kid. Amelia, go for it, bud. That could very well be, but now let's think that through, okay? If she, how do I do this without actually doing it? If I were to lay on my side, okay, and I were to lift up my body in the way you're describing and hold a baby in the way he depicts it, is that a comfortable thing? I have to do about a billion crunches to get my abs to work that way, right? <laughs> And so you're exactly right. That's exactly what she, she might not be resting on anything up into her core, right? Which is all the more reason that that's not a comfortable position. See, when we think of people laying down, we oftentimes think of, man, get me a pillow, let's go to sleep. But that's not what's happening. It's not possible because of the way her hands are working. And you're right. If she actually is lifting her trunk up off the, off the place where she's laying down, Man, you got to do a lot of sit-ups in order to be able to pull that one off, right? Good job. Because I don't think she'd be able to reach the cradle. She's totally laying on her side and doing this. Brilliant. You can't move your arms, right? Because then it would be too low for the animals to reach it. Contraman 2019 and physics scholar. <laughs> Physiology, right? Good job. Um, notice, too, what else is blue in this picture? The sky. It's not black, as in night. It's painted the same color blue as Mary. Which, dare we say, is a way for Giotto to tell us that inasmuch as Mary has fidelity to her son, God has fidelity to his son as well. Um, so what does all this tell us about our faith? all this stuff going on in this painting. What does this tell us about our faith? The use of blue by Giotto to depict the sky and to depict Mary, I think points to the fact that everything, literally everything in all creation, those things in heaven, those things on earth, ultimately stay true to Jesus. They can't help but stay true to Jesus. Now, as Amelia rightly pointed out, when we look more closely at the sheep, and I didn't even pick it up earlier today, let the children come to me and do not hit them. We will, even as faithful as we are, we will turn away. Our attention will be diverted away from the one who was born. But at the end of the day, I think what everything bears out is that everything in earth and in heaven ultimately stays true to Jesus. Consider the disciples. Jesus is going to call them, like Amelia said, they are going to be sheep who will turn away, their attention will get drawn in different directions. By the time Jesus goes to the cross, all with the exception of John, will have bailed for the hillside. Because they can't stand to watch what's happening to their Savior, and they can't stand to be around and have the threat of the same thing happening to them happen to them. And yet what ends up happening? Pentecost comes. The Holy Spirit, Ruach, comes in. The breath of God comes into those guys. And after that first Pentecost, what ends up happening? Every single one of those guys proves true to their Lord who they followed for three years prior. Every single one of those guys ends up not only spending the rest of their lives bearing witness, but they give the ultimate sacrifice of martyrdom for the sake of following Jesus. As Amelia rightly points out, sometimes sheep will turn their heads and have their attention drawn in different directions. But I think what the blue indicates is that at the end of time, everything, heaven, earth, those things above, those things below, will stay true to Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. They may not want to, but guess what? At the name of Jesus, you can't help it. Because what is true is true, and you can't deny it. 
the use of white with the midwife, I think points to the fact that we are not the center of attention in these things. We are not the ones for whom this story is about. He is the one who the story is about. And so, as she does with Mary and with Jesus, we point to him who is greater than us. More so than I can remember, we as a society are falling into the trap of thinking that the world revolves around us, or it should. We base, in some ways, how much our self-worth is valued based on likes that we get, based on retweets, be honest, how many times have you posted something on social media and you can't help it? You go back, did somebody like it? Did somebody see it? Did somebody repost it? Come on. This is the danger in our day and age is that we have the propensity to think that we're the center of the universe and what the midwife does and what the wife does. It shows us we're not the center of attention. In fact, we aren't the center of attention at all. He is the center of attention. Um, the use of 3D by Giada, this angel that leaps off the image that catches our attention. The concern in Byzantine art, as we said last week and again at the beginning tonight, is they were concerned that if you had anything that was 3D, that the danger was that you could turn that into an idol that you would worship. And what Giotto does is by using 3D and by having the angel leap off the image and be that character that really catches our attention, does that 3D image cause us to worship something else? And the answer is patently no. And it's important because what? Because the angel is not looking out at us, because the angel is not looking in any other direction except at the baby, at Mary. And so by jumping off the page, what we're invited to do is to participate in this image as well, but what happens is the moment we see that character who jumps off the page at us, our gaze follows where his goes, and that is down to the baby and to Mary. The inclusion of the ox and the donkey is crucial, too, to our faith. Because what they represent are both Israel and the Gentiles. What they represent are that animal which was considered clean and acceptable in terms of the ox, and that animal animal which was considered by folks in Bible days as being unclean and useful only for burden, only for work. And yet, both of them are brought together in all these depictions of artwork. They both stand at the birth of Jesus. The unclean and the clean. The inside and the outside. And this finally brings us to this mashup of all these things, to a place of what does this do in terms of our faith? And in terms of our faith, what an image like this does and all these different things going on is helps us to understand who is the only one who can have everything point to him in a picture like this, and yet who stayed perfectly true to God. Who's the one for whom the blue represents fidelity to him being the baby Jesus, and yet everything he did in his life, everything he said, was about his fidelity and his deference to the Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen. Who can be the one who is the true and right center of attention? And yet, in his own life, every single time, turn the attention away from himself and say, don't pay it to me, pay it to the one who sent me. Don't give it to me, give it to the one who sent me. He is the one who, even though we rightly make him the center of attention, was willing to point to the one even greater than him. Who is it who's been able to take that which was deemed unclean and declare it clean? Peter says, guys, stop worrying about whether or not food is clean or unclean. Don't worry about it. Jesus himself says, it's not what goes into you that's unclean. It's what comes out. Who is the one who can take that which is outside and bring it inside? A guy who's plagued by legion demons, a thousand or more demons, who people said, let him live in the cemetery. The guy's a little nuts. And yet Jesus breaks in and makes that guy 
whole again. Jesus comes in and he takes that guy who literally was outside and brings him back inside. Who is the one who can declare that that which was only good for selfish use is good for God's use? Who is the one who can take an ox of God's people Israel and the donkey of the Gentiles and be able to have them mash up and work in such a way that all of them are valued, that all of them are understood to be part of the plan, that all of them are declared because of what God has done for them to be good. It is him. It is him who, like the angel in the center of the picture tonight, and with that angel, what do we do with our faith? We leap off the page. We leap off in 3D worship, adoration, and in service to him who we celebrate during this season. The Lord be with you. Amen. I'll invite the usher forward at this time to receive my